evening, everybody, and welcome to Opera House Arts at the Stonington Opera House, virtual edition. This is our new reality for the time being, and we're just so thrilled that you could join us this evening. And especially thrilled because our musicians are be coming to us live all the way from around the world in Perth, Australia, where it is morning, very early morning, which as most of us who have ever lived in part of a jazz world know is not easy for jazz musicians. So we owe them a very special thanks tonight. Before we get started, I wanted to say that this event and my being here as the founding executive director, but no longer the director of Opera House Arts, standing in during this transition and helping to celebrate the 20th anniversary season of the Dear Al Jazz Festival. We could not possibly have gone into a 20th consecutive season without celebrating it in some way, but it's been difficult. Our beautiful little magic box on Stonington Harbor has had to be closed. We keep socially distanced. We are doing drive-in movies and we do have things like Shakespeare and Stonington last week and now this week, this fabulous virtual version of the Dear Al Jazz Festival. So tonight what you can expect is a mini concert from our wonderful musicians and a conversation with Larry Blumenfeld, whom I hope you are all familiar with. And if not, you will be after this evening. We started the Jazz Festival 20 years ago because of our interest in improvisation. And our interest in improvisation has a lot to do with how we live our lives. The Opera House's mission statement to foster and promote excellence in all the ways we perform our lives. That's about us being good students, good citizens, good parents, good educators. It's how we do everything every day and the crafts of our performing arts people, the acting, the musical craft, the improvisational understanding is key to really excellent performance. Improvisation, especially with its focus on listening and response, has always been super meaningful to Opera House Arts and to how we do our work. So the Jazz Festival is a pillar of Opera House Arts. We're really pleased that we didn't miss a season here, despite all of the challenges in our way. So without further ado, please let me introduce co-founder of the Dear All Jazz Festival, Larry Blumenfeld. Larry writes regularly about music for the Wall Street Journal. Larry, come on in, turn your camera on here. Here we go. Let's get your face in here. He writes regularly about music for the Wall Street Journal. There he is. Hello. His culture reporting has appeared in the New York Times, the Daily Beast, and Chamber Music Magazine, among many other publications and websites. His long collaboration with the National Jazz Museum in Harlem includes his ongoing jazz and social justice series. And I think we're gonna hear a little piece of that tonight. He was the 2019 Jeanette K. Watson Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Humanities at Syracuse University. He curates the Wells Fargo Jazz Series for the Spolito Festival USA in Charleston, South Carolina. And most importantly, he curates the Deer Isle Jazz Festival at the Stonington Opera House for Opera House Arts. Welcome, Larry. Good evening, thanks so much, Linda. I don't wanna to talk too much because we wanna hear some music, but I have to say a few things. Um, first of all, obviously, earlier this month, I should be there. I should be on Deer Isle, I should be in Stonington, I should be giving a hug to my good friends on the island, many of whom made the Deer Isle Jazz Festival possible. Um, I should be playing basketball on the basketball court over where, um, was it not Fisherman? Yeah, where Fisherman's Friend used to be. I'm not doing any of that. This is how we live now. This is how we share culture. But the festival is always very much about community, the community around improvised music, the community around arts. And this is the way we have community now. About 25 years ago, my wife, Eric, and I wanted to get away from Brooklyn. I wanted to get away from writing about jazz. We drove up to Doral, we fell in love with the place. I didn't realize that I'd bring the whole jazz thing up there, but it's been miraculous. 
um, and it's become a second home for me, and it's become a second home for all the mu music that I love and for the musicians that I admire. So the good side of that is that because we're doing this virtually, I've wanted to get Fabian Almazan and Linda Mejano up to Dear Al for a long time. Uh, I admired them for a long time independently in their careers as musicians. I admired the way they played together. And then not too long ago, they became a married couple. And I knew that they would love this place as much as I love this place, in part because they both share a love of nature and a commitment to the environment which one of the things we'll talk about when we do sit, well, not sit down, but when we virtually sit down to talk is Biophilia Records, the label that Fabian Almazan began, which is so committed to environmentalism that they've got an environmentalist on staff and that all the musicians participate in advocacy. Well, let me just, so I first heard Fabian Almazan play piano as a young pianist in Terrence Blanchard's band, trumpeter Terrence Blanchard's band. He's still in that band. I knew within the first minute or two of an introduction to a tune that he played that had Cuban classical music and earlier jazz and many other things that, well, I wanna hear more of this guy. And ever since I've followed him as he's distinguished himself as a composer, a band leader, and a, a musician that's helped shape my landscape. The opposite happened with Linda May I know. I first heard her original music and her band leading and was struck by its creativity and its depth. And then I realized that she was a sought after side person and band member. And I started hearing her in all sorts of environments with leading players, including these days she tours in guitarist Pat Metheny's quartet. Independently, separately, both of these musicians are, are vital and innovative artists we get the pleasure of hearing them together um, all the way from Perth, Australia, where they are right now. So I just wanna please give a virtual hand to Fabian Almazan and Linda Mejano, and after the music, we'll uh, do some talking. Come join us. Here we are. Here we are. See you soon.
Okay. We'll be joining Fabian and Linda for a discussion. Every, you know, I've gotten used to watching political conventions without conventioneers and watching NBA playoff games without fans, but I still have never got, and have not gotten used to watching musicians and hearing musicians play and then not immediately hearing the sound of applause. But uh, I hope you are applauding in your homes or wherever you are. Um, and right about now, the sun would probably be setting gloriously over the harbor. And uh, yeah, so we've always had a commitment to live music, improvised music in the moment. And so even across the world from Perth, Australia to you, through cables and Wi-Fi, we've continued that tradition. Um, Fabian, Linda, I can't thank you enough. Um, we got you? Okay. Fabian, Linda, that was wonderful. I can't thank you enough. I know you woke up and started playing at around 7 a.m. your time, right? Yeah. Like 6.30. <laughs> yeah, sound check at 6.30, yeah. I can't. Yeah. Need more volume. Uh, Hello. Bring the mics real close. Hello. Can you hear us okay. now? Okay. I know, I've, I think I explained to you that to the folks on Deer Isle, 7 a.m. is sleeping in. It's not rising <laughs> early. Um, you know, any in the past several few months, anytime I've talked talk to or interviewed musicians, I always start this way. When was the last time that each of you or both of you played before a live audience? I'm, try, I'm trying to, well, I should explain things. Things here are uh, significantly different than really? what they were back in New York. Um, oh, we still haven't played for a live yeah, audience. Yeah, we haven't played for a live audience, mm -hmm. but you are tonight. <laughs> yeah, um, so, uh, I mean, we were both in different places um, when the, the COVID um, shutdown kind of happened globally. We're not hearing um, you. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Um, we were both in uh, different places when the COVID shutdown happened. I think my last official show was in, um, in Auckland, in New Zealand. Um, I'm sorry, you're cutting and in and out. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're good. Okay, is that better? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Almost. Okay. Okay, cool. Bear um, with us, folks. Sure. Is the connection okay or everything okay? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think the last official gig was uh, with Pat Matheny. Um, in Auckland, in New Zealand, for me, and we flew all the way to Buenos Aires in Argentina to start the um, South American leg of our tour. And everything was kind of all set to go. Um, South America is one of the, I guess, last continents to kind of slowly shut down um, larger gigs. So we were set to finish the tour in um, Buenos Aires, in Peru, in Brazil, Cuba, and Mexico. Um, Chile as well, um, but then one by one, each of them started toppling down like dominoes, and we ended up flying to Buenos Aires. Uh, well, we did actually a, a small clinic for a school, um, which was great. Um, I should mention, which I forgot to at the, at, out front, Fabian, Fabian was born in Havana, Cuba, moved to the U.S. No. when he was nine. Linda yes. was born in Malaysia to Chinese parents and raised in in Australia, and then the two of them established careers and met in the United States. Did you meet each other by playing in each other? I remember hearing Linda in your band, Fabian. I don't, when was the first time that you played together? Uh, it must, you can hear me now. <laughs> Please, for the love of God, be able to hear me now. You can hear me, okay. Yes, cool. Um, we we met at Manhattan School of Music in 2006. We had an improv class together, 
um, and that's the first time we ever played. And it was very clear to me that Linda was not normal. Um, <laughs> Which is what you want know. out of an improviser, right? Yeah. Well, not just an improviser, but also a composer. Um, mm -hmm. She would she would bring in every week these like 10, 15 page long compositions while everybody else was struggling to write eight bars. So how do you, I'm going to interview my wife. How? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I I just you know, <laughs> I think yeah I don't know. I just I just I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed trying out some things, and that often meant um, long forms. I <laughs> um, my writing has evolved since then. <laughs> um, it's not always as long and complex, but um, but yeah. I mean, I think school is a great place to experiment and try some of these things, and um, you know one thing I would say to my students is like, man, you've, you've got all these really talented young minds here to help workshop your music. So really spend that time, take the time to, to, you know, try stuff out when you're in school, you know, it's cause it's very different when you leave. So, um, yeah, so I kind of embraced it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So as long Probably. as we're embarrassing each other, Linda, what was your impression of hearing Fab Fabian for when you met at Manhattan? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to hold on to the mic. For oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I, well, it was kind of quite funny because um, I, I think when we both entered um, our master's degree, um, so everyone kept talking about how talented this pianist was, um, uh, Fabian Almazan, and SF. Go on. <laughs> you, had, you had actually broken your hand um, using a, one of those carts to carry a keyboard or something. Uh, the, uh, a finger. I, yeah, I my fourth finger got caught in a cart as I was going to a gig. I had just bought this cart. Mm. So, um, so I heard how fantastic this, this pianist was and we were in improv class together and we would always talk about birds and stuff. I, I, I remember my first conversation was about birds in Australia because um, uh, Fabian's a real bird fan. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a, a Willy, Willy Wagtail. Willy Wagtail. So they have great names for everything here in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we became really good friends and, um, uh, and it wasn't until months later that I actually heard you play even because you, you had your injury and yeah, um, yeah, and we've been good friends ever since. So. Yeah, that gig, that gig was going, uh, it was for a nursing home. I was very, very broke. I was playing every gig I, I possibly could. Uh, not, not that playing in a nursing home is like beneath me or anything, but yeah, I went to that gig and I couldn't play with my right hand for that gig. And on the way to that gig, the driver accidentally drove over somebody's foot. So it was, it was, it was a very messed up day. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I actually, I do know all about the fascination with birds and maybe, you know, I mentioned up top a little bit about biophilia and about environmentalism. And I know that for both of you, nature, well, first of all, in Deer Isle and, and Stonington and, and Maine in general, I was able to gain a little greater connection and appreciation with the nature around me. And then as I got involved in this community, there, I realized, well, here are, you know, all these people who are rising early and whose life and livelihood and sustenance is so tied to the environment around them, to the water that surrounds them, to the bounty from that water, and to just, you know, the, the nature that surrounds them in general. And, and when I watched, you know, coves fill and empty with the tides, I watched these great skies change color. It kind of made a connection me, to me to the music that we talk about um, in terms of how things change and are organic. Can you talk, I know Fabian, when I was with you in Cuba, you talked about the zoo down the street and how you started to get relate to nature. Can you each talk a little bit about maybe your connections as people to this concept of environmentalism? Yeah, I mean, it's it's still all very mysterious to me. Um, I don't I don't claim to have any answers, but I just know that um, I I love my wife and I love the natural world, nature, um, just living things in general. Ever since I was a kid, 
I've really been uh, drawn to that. And the zoo you're alluding to, yeah, that's in the center of Havana. Um, it was very emotional for me because I actually visited it, visited it <laughs> after being gone for 23 years. Um, yeah, I used to hear the animals at night because we lived about four blocks away from that zoo. And yeah, I, I'm glad that I, <laughs> that I like the things that I do and that I care about them uh, deeply. Um, and yeah, it's just, I hope to kind of uh, rekindle that love that we have for nature with our listeners. Um, Cause I feel like all children are born with that. Um, and I think it's, it, it's just fascinating. It makes everything worthwhile for me. When, oh yeah, go on. So Linda, Linda, you were going to say. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, f for me, growing up in Perth, Western Australia, um, I mean, it's beautiful here. Um, it's, you know, one of the upsides of being one of the most isolated major cities is that um, it, although... Though it is a, a major city, there's a lot of appreciation for nature. The beach is, is really not far, and um, uh, growing up, it was maybe about a five-minute drive or a half-an-hour walk um, to, to the coast um, for, from where we lived. And, um, yeah, there's just a beautiful appreciation. There's beautiful national parks here. And not far, it's like maybe a ten-minute drive is Yelagonga National Park, which, you know... See what I mean about the names? What's that called? Yelagonga. It's, it's indigenous. <laughs> a lot of, yeah, we have a lot of great names. Um, and uh, yeah, so and there's, we just drove past yesterday and there were all these kangaroos out in the open open um, field and it's, it's, it's gorgeous and um, uh, quite striking and I'm very lucky to have grown up here. Um, Fabian, I, can, I know that last project of yours had a whole genesis regarding some field work, some recordings. Can you describe a little bit what that process was? Uh, sure. Um, well, it all lined up uh, beautifully. Uh, I, was, I was going to play with Terrence Blanchard at the festival, uh, which happens in December in, in Havana and Santiago de Cuba. And um, the Jerome uh, Foundation Fund was able to also provide me with some grant money, which made it possible for me to get the equipment that I needed to go out in the jungles in Cuba and record endemic bird songs, which I then incorporated into the last album, which is entitled This Land Abounds With Life. And yeah, it was one of the most joyous five days of my life to go out there in nature. I, I was able to go out with a cousin of mine that I hadn't seen in 23 years either. and. And that was really f nice and fun, too, to, to catch up with someone that, you know, we, we used to race when I was, like, seven years old to see who could win. He still could win. <laughs> yeah. You know, in New York, in New York City, where I almost hesitate to say a jazz scene, because I think it's also the world that you two inhabit maybe now is more referred to as the creative music scene with capital C for creative. But, you know... I think people tend to associate that with some kind of urban mentality um, and a very New York centric, American centric mentality. Do, do, or you know, being, or, yes, I, as you know from my work, I would say New Orleans yeah. too. Um, yeah. But coming from Havana and growing up there, or you know, b having your beginnings there and growing up in Australia. Um, and having this connection to nature, do you think that maybe gives you a little different perspective on the way you, what you bring to that scene? Is, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I, that's, I think, I think that's the whole reason that people gravitate towards the, this cultural music that is jazz or uh, black, black American music, whatever, whatever word uh, we want to use for it. It's an American art form that, brings people together and champions the individual voice uh, over everything else, which is why we love people like John Coltrane or Monk, who I see back there. Uh, <laughs> yes, you do. They, they were themselves. Um, and that's... Salute. <laughs> they, they were themselves. And I don't know. I kind of feel like 
I will let my wife speak now. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, I was just not let. But just <laughs> <laughs> you're you're Please in trouble. Um, I mean, just kind of um, tacking onto the back of that. Um, yeah, the the individual voice, yeah, for sure. But the freedom to express, and within, for me personally, in an ensemble context, like um, to really work together, you know, um, when it comes to improvisation, because you don't, there's no set rules, that, and you have the freedom to express yourself, but you still kind of have to work with one another, and and I think there's a part of that universal language which is is what we as human beings have to do you know we do have to improvise day to day we have to be resourceful uh, a lot of people i i did not see this pandemic you know reaching to to this degree you know and we all have to at times you know um think on our feet and and work together and and that that's what i i love about this music this freedom to express the individual but to work together as well you know, bio, Biophilia is the only label I know, the only music label I know that has an environmental specialist on staff, at least on your website, as one of the, one of the members of the label. And I know there's a certain commitment that the artists make to that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you structured all of this and how it works and also maybe how it affects the music making? Yeah, well, I... I care very much about the things that I care about, but I am also very aware that I respect everybody's choices, everybody's decisions. Uh, I, by no means do I want to come across as preachy or anything like that, you know, to, to each his own, follow your bliss. I'm just following mine, uh, Joseph Campbell. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, essentially I just want to have a, a label that uh, promotes imaginative creative music that that is that is made from a from an honest uh place um because uh, to me to me meaningful honest music is it's just as as beneficiary as medicine um it really is one of the most crucial aspects of my life to have that medicine which is music um the, the second emphasis of the label is to promote the dialogue of uh, environmentalism and conservation and things like that. Uh, we've taken a couple of initiatives as a label to stay true to that philosophy. Uh, one of them is that we make uh, a biofolio, which <laughs> I've seen you open and close. <laughs> uh, it's made entirely out of paper. It's uh, origami. It has a download code inside so that fans can download the music in high quality audio, even higher than CDs. Uh, that's one thing that puts less plastic out there in the environment, which has a, a terrible impact. And you, can get, you can get better audio, audio quality too, up to 96K sample rate, which is double the quality that you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second thing we do, you know, when there's no pandemic going on is that we'll volunteer within different communities to do things like cleanups uh, or uh, tree plantings. Uh, we've performed for students at the public schools in Brooklyn, things like that, just trying to help the community as much as we can. And uh, the most recent thing as of yesterday, which I'm very, very uh, excited about, is we just started something called Impacts, which is a commissioning series for writers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we were in touch about this uh, earlier. And our first uh, writer is, is Peter Utunde from Kenya. Yeah, Nairobi. Yeah, from Nairobi. And he, he wrote about the Dandura uh, dump site, which is the largest dump site in, in all of Africa. Um, this is what's called a sacrifice zone, which exists throughout the, the world. It's, it's places where the, the disenfranchised are the ones suffering the harmful toll of pollution. Um, so we, we just uh, posted that he wrote in a very insightful article about the, that community in Nairobi and Kenya. And um, yeah, hopefully anybody out there that's reading uh, these articles and can help somehow, please get in touch with, with me uh, or uh, yeah, info at biophiliarecords.com and I'll put you in touch with Peter. Um, yeah. And that's on the 
website now the blog it's it's already yeah it's on the on biophilyrecords.com yeah it I, I recommend um reading it and, and checking out those striking photos that those are peter's photos as well yeah it's it's striking it's it's really um unbelievable to to read and to see those photos yeah and savvy linda nelson has just put that email address in the chat for us um mm -hmm. um I'm glad you mentioned that idea of music as as the medicine we need um, as something that, that gives us sustenance in this, you know, we're not well, only I should I should be clear vaccines are very Oh, well, yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, actual not, medicine. I, I'm happy to talk about why we should all be vaccinated yeah, once yes. it comes out. And, and vaccine <laughs> and vaccines that have been properly developed and tested too before they're Advertise, yes. <laughs> but that's a different conversation. But I yeah. do, you know, we're in a, we're in a, even beyond the pandemic moment, extended moment, we're in, we're in a moment of many tensions, many, many things bubbling to the surface, maybe in good and transformative ways, but also, hey, who just ran by? <laughs> oh, it's a, a little friend, a three, well, not a uh, three-legged cat named Fanta that lives here. Yeah, All right. it's my sister's <laughs> cat. Yeah, three-legged cat named Fanta. <laughs> I think there's the name of a title for a song right there. Um, and nobody told me she only had three legs when I first met her, so I thought I had extreme jet lag. <laughs> she only had three legs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it just in this moment that we're in that's so pent up and boiling over is, you know, is music, this culture that we can share really, you know, will that help transform that moment or help us grasp that moment? Do you, do you, I mean, maybe that's an obvious question, but how do you feel the, the music that you create and the music that you play either speaks to this moment or exists in it? Um, I mean, for one, I would have to say the, I, I really do think that um, um, once, like uh, once shows start happening um, around the world, um, I, I think people already feel how important live music is and um, live music, especially music that, that is improvised or, or largely improvised because it's, um, you know, it, it is, we've taken it for granted in many ways, you know, now that we don't have these um, live shows to actually be at and to, to, to um, be, you know, a couple of feet away from, from musicians or, you know, or even with uh, a whole group of uh, people in the audience, you know, there's just something about that, that live aspect that I think uh, um, musicians as well as, as um, listeners um, really crave. And I think once that starts happening again, we'll, we'll really um, realize how much we appreciate that, you know, and I, I think... I think there will be, like, um, uh, there, ha there has been some talk about, oh, you know, with live streaming, it's, um, we're just going to get used to that and everyone's going to stay at home. And I, I don't quite believe that. I kind of think it's going to be the opposite of once it, once it kind of kicks up again, it's, it's going to be a different, you know. Um, so, so that for me, you know, um, we have been able to play a bit more with musicians here because there were literally zero active wow. cases in this state. And um, I'm actually playing a, a show tonight. It's actually my first show since um, New Zealand um, and Pat, Pat Metheny's tour. And um, I don't think it's completely at full capacity yet here in Western Australia, but it won't take long, I think, um, for it to be at full capacity. And, um, and it's just, it's unreal to, to just play with people. And, and um, I'd, sometimes we just kind of take it for granted, you know, in many ways. And, and it's something that I'm very grateful for. Yeah, for, for me, I feel like I remember reading it in a book by E.O. Wilson, uh, who is behind the whole inspiration for Biophilia Records. E.O. Wilson is an etymologist that and writes about the theory. And a brilliant writer, yeah. Yeah. So he, he writes about uh, the, the origins of art as we know it in society, which is just sitting around a campfire uh, late at night and telling stories to each other and being able to recognize each other's experiences mm -hmm. and and that's essentially for you know for you and for for us we're we're all artists we're all sharing stories and yeah it's a very different experience when you're sharing a story with a screen 
Yes, um, but I think yeah. that I think that's actually a beautiful sentiment on which to say for us good night, for you good morning. Um, I I do you know I th- uh, despite any of the technical compromises, I'm so glad we could gather like this and and um, and you know just to just to experience the the energy of you two playing together meant a lot. Um, so yeah. Thank you for our campfire sharing stories. <laughs> Next time, I hope it will be for real. And um, yeah. you can see and smell and touch um, and eat all that I, made me fall in love with, uh, with Deer Isle. Um, I know mm. I'll be seeing and hearing you two again. I hope in person soon. So people who are still there tuning in, you have a couple of options now. You can go to the NEA, well, you can probably find anywhere. Right now, the NEA Jazz Masters Ceremony, which is also happening virtually from San Francisco, is going on and they're enshrining four, one, three musicians and one advocate. That's worth doing. And right around the time that ends, Joe Biden will probably be accepting his nomination and making his speech. Um, Thanks for gathering. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Opera House Arts. Thanks all to my friends there and uh, go have some breakfast. I'm going to go have some dinner. I'm grateful to you. All right. Good seeing you, Larry. Take and care. thank you to everyone. Okay.